Well, in one of Aesop's fables, you remember that? Aesop, one of my favorite times growing up as a kid, was coming home and watching Bullwinkle. You remember Bullwinkle? Some of you older folks. Aesop's fables was on there. It was all accurate, too, completely. Well, in one of his fables, a donkey was walking through the woods, and he finds a skin of a lion. See, hunters had killed the lion and left the skin out to dry in the sun. And so when the donkey saw this, he was delighted because somehow he was able to put this skin on himself. And he went running through the forest, rejoicing because he had found some new respect with the other animals. You see, when they saw him, they had fear. They thought this was a lion. And so rejoicing at that, the donkey brayed in his happiness only to give himself away by his voice. The moral of the fable is clear. Fine clothes may disguise, but silly words will disclose a fool. Now let me ask you something more serious. How much thought do you give to your words What do our words reveal about us? What do they say about us? It's a question that we need to consider. Because the Lord says something here in verse 37 that shocks me. Maybe it shocks you. Verse 37, look there. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words... You will be condemned. It should give us pause to consider intently just what the words we speak say about us. If you recall, Jesus has been accused by the Pharisees of delivering a man from demon possession by the power of Satan. If you look back at verse 24 of Matthew 12, there we read the Pharisees accusing him, saying, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Their words are telling. Their words reveal something about them. They expose something that is in their hearts. Last week we heard Jesus issue a warning to the Pharisees in verses 31 and 32. Look there. He says, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. The Pharisees are blaspheming the Son of God, and they are blaspheming God the Holy Spirit. They are speaking slander against Him. They are speaking malicious talk against Jesus for what? For Him doing good. They have heard Him speak only goodness. They have seen Him do mighty works that were only for the good of others. He has fulfilled the veracity of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah. And for this confirmation of identity, for them finally getting the King, the long-awaited King, They blaspheme Him. It is the Spirit of God who has given them light and knowledge. It is the Spirit of God who has revealed Christ. He has revealed Him as the Messiah of Israel. This knowledge, it provokes the people to say, can this be the Son of David? For the first time they are stirred by the knowledge that they have been given, by the light that has been shown on them. Can this be the one we've waited for? To which the Pharisees quickly scoff and say, No. He has a demon, and he casts out demons by demons. 
they are disguised as good. But their words give them away as evil. They speak silly words against God. This is a severe sin against the Spirit of God. He has illumined their minds to know, oh, not to the point of salvation, but He has given them light to know that Christ is who the Scripture speaks of. In other words, they can't plead ignorance. They can't say on the last day, on the judgment day, Lord, I I didn't know. No. Hebrews 10.26, it speaks to this unforgivable sin that they are committing. For if we go on sinning deliberately, the writer of Hebrews says, 10.26, for if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. But... How much more punishment, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? You see, they had received enough light. They had received enough knowledge to know who Jesus is. And so now the Pharisees, they're culpable for their words because after knowing the truth of who Jesus is by the Holy Spirit, they willfully remain in ignorance, making them without excuse. And speaking blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Jesus will now deliver a scathing rebuke against them for their carelessness of their words. To do this, He will show the relationship between a man's words and his heart. What is the relationship between a man's words and his heart? And so Jesus draws an analogy in verse 33 saying, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. It's simple enough. It's axiomatic, it's evident. A tree is known as either good or or it's known as it's bad. And how is it known? By its fruits. Now it's important to realize that in context, fruit refers to words and tree refers to the heart. In other words, Jesus is saying that you can know a man by what he says. You can know a man or a woman by what he says. You can know whether a man is good or evil by the fruit of his words, for the tree is known by its fruits. Some years ago, my brother had two lemon trees in his backyard. I may have told you this before. And they grew up side by side, both of them very large. Bright green leaves. Thick, lots of yellow lemons on it. The trees look spectacular. Now, one tree's fruit, if you were to pick it, it was sweet with some sour. The texture, it it was firm, it was juicy. But the second tree, if you were to pick its fruit, it was sour and bitter alkaline tasting its texture was mushy and it was dry i knew which tree was good by the fruit though they looked the same they both looked glorious but i knew which one was bad which one was good and i knew it not because of the appearance but because of its fruit and so it is with men 
And so Christ cuts to the quick in verse 34, saying to the Pharisees, You brood of vipers. Imagine starting a conversation like that. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's asking a rhetorical question. How can you, being evil, how can you speak good? Because they are evil. They are unable to speak what is good. They are bad trees with bad fruit. There is no denying this. He says, you brood of vipers, or maybe more to the point, you offspring of snakes. They have just blasphemed Christ for being in league with Satan. And now he is saying, no, you're the offspring of Satan. Your fruit is evil. Why? We'll look at verse 34 again. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why is your fruit evil? For or because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your tree is bad because your heart is filthy and polluted. Nothing comes from that deep wellspring except abundant sewage. In Proverbs 15.28 we read, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Listen again. The mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. It gushes out. It can literally be rendered, it belches out. You Pharisees, you are the offspring of Satan, and like your father the devil, you expel wickedness. It's Evangelism 101, right? Well, let's ask some questions. One, what is the heart? After all, the Bible warns in Proverbs 4.23 to watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the issues of life. So what is the heart? Well, one pastor defines heart from Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the authentic person. It is the part of our being where we desire, deliberate, and decide It has been described as a place of conscious and decisive spiritual activity. The comprehensive term for a person as a whole, listen, as a whole in his feelings, in his desires, in his passions, in his thought, in his understanding, in his will. It is the center of a person. The heart is your root, and it's from there that we produce the fruit. There's an old country proverb that aptly illustrates this. What's in the well comes up in the bucket. Sounds like something Max would say. What's in the well comes up in the bucket. Furthermore, left to ourselves, left in our natural condition, each of our trees only produce bad fruit. That is the reality. God says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that our hearts are more deceptive and deceitful than all else, and they are desperately sick. Jesus said in Mark 7, 21 and 23, he said this concerning the natural man, from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, Adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. It's not your environment. It's not your DNA. It's not your mommy and daddy. It's your heart. These sins come from within. That is really bad news 
this is really bad news. Because behavior modification, it won't rid us of a sick heart. We can't clean ourselves up. Let me give you an illustration of just how pervasive and penetrating sin's filth is in the human heart. Follow the illustration. A man named James B. Nelson, he links his alcoholism... He links his alcoholism with the pervasiveness of sin in his heart. He describes his addiction, how it has total control, and how it mimics a bad heart. Quoting, alcoholism is that way. It is a total phenomenon that affects the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. It affects every relationship. Everything suffers distortion because of it. In the midst of the active alcoholism, my brain suffered organic changes. My drinking increased my lactic acid, my uric acid, and the fat content of my liver. Though more measurable in some parts of my body than in others, alcohol affected every cell. Do you understand what he is saying when it comes to sin? He's saying... Sin is like his alcoholism, the way it is pervasive, the way it penetrates. Sin is pervasive in every part of me. It's like I'm soaking in a toxic bath of evil. It penetrates every part of me, every nook and cranny, every unseen part. It is intoxicating every cell in me and in you. The old adage of just follow your heart sounds so romantic, but it's wrong and it's deadly and it's foolish. For trees that produce bad fruit, there is no amount of self-control you can do. There is no willpower that's strong enough. There are no programs for behavior modification that will change the heart. The willpower course of action will lead to frustration and ruin. Give it time and you will commit the same sin again and again and again and again. All of our sins that we commit come out of a wellspring of polluted water. And simply modifying the taste won't change it. It won't change the well. It won't change what produces that water. I need a new heart. You need a new heart. This is what God tells His people in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. God speaking says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. A new heart. That is what is required. A new heart from the Spirit of God. As He does His work, it is a gift. And that's all it is. It's a gift. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We obtain it by grace. The theological term is regeneration. The practical Christian vernacular is being born again. That is what we need. Now let's stop for a moment, okay? Let's not... Tune out. Let's not think, oh, this is the part where Troy launches into A, B, and C. I've heard this before. We need to stop and consider where this sermon is going and what Jesus is saying about words. Because we all have someone in our lives that's a Pharisee. Every one of us. We all have someone in our lives who is spiritual but is rotten to the core.
most of us in this room are not strangers to coming to church. We're not strangers to hearing Christianity or Christianese or the vernacular of the church. But we all know someone intimately who's a Pharisee. Sadly, this might describe you. It could be you. You could be the Pharisee. Are we like the donkey that puts the lion skin on? We look good. We look like that beautiful lemon tree. We think we're Christian until we open our mouths and our foolish, evil words, they betray us. They give us away. I love teaching theology and doctrine. I enjoy seeing people experience God. I get excited about truth being imparted. But if I'm being honest, and I will be, I wonder if churches are really seeing people being born again or if they're really just seeing people fitting in. Because that's so much of the Christian message these days is we want people to fit in. I think Charles Spurgeon is the one who said, do not think that Christians are made by education. They are made by creation. Our church is filled with good trees among a few bad trees? Or are they filled with bad trees pretending to be good trees? The whole passage here causes me to consider and what what I've experienced in churches causes me to reconsider the whole thing. I had a meme that was sent to me just this morning on my phone. It said if the Apostle Paul was to visit the American church, we would get a letter. I think it's true. What kind of tree are you? What does your mouth produce? Paul takes this up in Romans 3. There he speaks of the natural man. The man or the woman who needs to be born again. There he writes of the chief attribute of the unregenerate person. He says this about those who are unregenerate. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Is that us? Is that you? Is that description of human depravity even you now? What are you known by? Ask the question, what are you known by? The fruit that you speak, is it good or is it bad? How are you characterized by others? How would your coworkers characterize you? How would your children, how would your spouses? Would they characterize you by your words being love and edification, encouragement and truth? Or would they say that you're characterized by slander and gossip and criticism and half-truths? Commentator Leon Morris, he wrote something that I think is very sobering that we should replay over and over and over in our head because it's a sub-theme that goes throughout this gospel. He writes, the words men speak will have a bearing on their degrees of reward in heaven or degrees of suffering in hell. Do we think about our words? Stealing from Spurgeon again, he preached. The Scripture does not say you must improve yourself. The Scripture says you must be born again. So I ask, are you born again? Are you simply trying to fit in? That's a question we have to all consider. Long-time churchgoers, 
Are you born again? Or are you just fitting in? Your words, our words, my words say a lot about us. Maybe we're not listening. And so I say, ask God to draw you to himself. Ask God to help you. Ask God to cause you to flee to him. Ask God to help you repent. Ask God to stop blaspheming him. Ask God to give me life. Well, we need to move on. Verse 35 says, The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. By analogy, again, all men, Christ says, possess a treasure in themselves. It's funny. He pits good treasure and evil treasure. All men possess treasure in themselves. The important thing to understand here is the word treasure. The word treasure speaks figuratively of a, of a reservoir or of a storehouse or of a treasure chest. So it is either a good treasure chest or it is an evil treasure chest. What Jesus is saying that within our treasure chest is a storehouse of fruit. And only the fruit that is there can come out of us. Only the fruit that we are will come out of that. If it is good fruit because we are born again, then that's what it will be. If it is evil fruit because we are lost and dead in our sins, it will be evil. He continues warning them, verse 36, saying, I tell you, on the day of judgment, there is a day of judgment coming. That message has been lost. We don't talk about it much anymore. On that day, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. The Pharisees have just told the crowd, Jesus subdues devils by the power of the devil. If ever there was a careless word spoken, there it is. What exactly are careless words? Maybe your translation says empty words or idle words. What exactly is a careless, empty, or idle word? These are words that are purposeless. They are lazy words. They are useless words. They are words that wander about unproductively and travel around causing trouble. Picture the water cooler talk at work. Empty words. Or maybe you're one of those keyboard warriors on Twitter or Facebook typing out careless words. Maybe you're just somebody who has that cyberspace courage via email. Keyboard courage. Those are careless words. Pastor Paul Carter states that careless words are our flippant words. They are off-the-cuff remarks. They are our hot takes. They provide unique insight into the true nature and essential character of us. You know, careless words are meant to inflate one self. That is it. They are meant to inflate me while degrading somebody else. That's what careless words do. A philosopher named Will Durant once said, to speak ill of others is a dishonest way of praising ourselves. Have you ever thought about it? When we speak ill of others, it is our way of praising ourselves. I think that's an accurate picture of the Pharisees. I think that's painted well. Their ill words against Jesus promoted self-praise. They are brash, rotten trees and arrogantly curse God while patting themselves on the back. They are insolent creatures who curse the Creator. Jesus, you cast out demons by Beelzebub. Please notice, 
Jesus has moved from this outright slanderous blasphemy of the Pharisees that they have used against God, the Holy Spirit. He has moved from that to even thoughtless words that are spoken against men. And those will be measured and weighed in God's just scales. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for early, every careless word they speak. People will give an account for every word spoken. Millions upon millions of words that I have spoken, that you have said from your mouth, all recorded by God, all remembered by Him. Admittedly, this verse startles me. It scares me. It terrifies me. How many careless words have I spoken against God's creatures, against God's man who's been made in His image? How many? How many millions upon millions of idle words have I used to curse His creation? Oh, that I would have listened I would have listened to Psalm 141.3's plea where it says, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Why did I not heed that? Maybe you think I'm overblowing the issue. I mean, your words. Is it really such a big deal? Are our words that meaningful? I mean, look again. Verses 36 and 37 say, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For, that means because, because by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Let that sit on you a second. A writer named Greg Morse penned these convicting words. Put yourself into this statement, what I will read. I read this and I had to be in the words themselves. I am tempted to have low expectations of judgment because I have a low view of words. It's not that big a deal, right? I am tempted to have a low expectation of judgment because I have a low view of my words that I speak idly against people. I have a low view of words, and that is a view that Jesus does not share. He will review our careless words with us because He expects our words to incline towards youthfulness, to yield godly effect, to be seasoned with salt, to give grace to our hearers. He expects our words to avoid blasphemy, slander, and lying. Those are all too small an aim for a human mouth. We think because we don't do those big, big sins of the mouth that we're silly because careless words, small words, they also stink like sin because all of our words ought to be worth speaking for good and to produce fruits with an aim at others' benefit and to stand in unflagging support of God's glory. Maybe you still think that our words are not a big deal. I want you to listen to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. I want you to listen to what he seems to think about our words. A prophet of God. There we read Isaiah 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said... Isaiah speaking, I said, woe is me, 
for I am lost, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Do you hear Isaiah's self-condemnation for his words? The prophet of God says, Woe is me. I am ruined. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people with those same unclean lips. And now my eyes see, they see the Lord of hosts, and I feel dirty and low, and my sin of my mouth is exposed. His eyes, they're looking at the Holy King. It's funny, we read all kinds of books, hear all kinds of songs. The prophet of God, Isaiah, the man of God, doesn't leap into the lap of the Lord. He doesn't get down on his knees and put his chin in his hands and look up fondly at God. He doesn't high-five him. No, he falls on his face, confessing his sin as unclean words, not only for his tongue, but for the tongues of those that are around him. It's funny, he didn't lament that he lived in a land of sexual sexual sins. He didn't lament the fact that people were murdering. He didn't lament the fact of idolatry. He lamented what he said. His unclean lips had horrified him before the righteous one, leaving him crushed under the weight of his careless, idle, empty words. Beloved, John Calvin said, Our tongues were made for glorious purposes. That's all. Our mouths, our tongues were made for glorious purposes. Every time we slander men speaking what he called trifling fooleries, every time we do that, we commit violence against God. Oh, the tongue is a small member, says James. Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Listen, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Again, I ask you, what do our words reveal about us? This verse, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word that they speak because your words will be justified. By your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. What in the world is that? I thought we were justified by faith alone in Christ alone. That is what we preach here. That is what we believe the Scripture teaches. We are not justified or declared right before God because of anything we do. Salvation is holy of God. So what's going on? At the judgment of Jesus Christ, when He introduces the record of our words, if our mouths have been a constant stream of careless and blasphemous words, those words will condemn us to hell. 
We have given evidence that our hearts were never justified by faith. We are like those Pharisees of old when Jesus declared to them in Matthew 15, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he called the people and he said to them, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles the, purpose, the person. This is a hard issue. But, here's the good news. On that day, if our words come out of a heart that speaks edification, encouragement, love, mercy, grace, if our speech has been seasoned with salt, where it preserves and it purifies, those words give evidence that our hearts have been made alive through faith, and they will justify us. Our words matter. Our words matter. What do they say about you? Consider. Beloved, I want you to hear the forgiveness of our Lord. I want you to understand that even as sinners, we fall into the trap of using our lips for wrong purposes and, and slandering people and speaking empty words. But God, through His Son Christ, has made provision for us, and so He gives us an assurance of pardon from sin. We read it from 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a well-pleasing sacrifice, to be a propitiation for our sins. Pray with me.